You know, one of the, the problems we have as engineers, particularly in the space program, is that there's 60 years of knowledge that have been built up about how things work properly and correctly. And you don't want to mess with that when you have human lives on the line. And that results in us using the same systems over and over again. And, and what I tell my students are, they've got to bust that mold. They need to apply that and overcome this design inertia. And it may be that we need uh, something similar when we approach UAP, is that we've had a lot of ideas about what they are. We have to kind of approach it with an open mind. And to do so, we have to also recognize our own internal biases of how we are subject to illusion and mis being misled by data. We have an optimism bias. You know, we optimistically think we could solve this problem because we should have the basic root skills to do so. And so, you know, we think we might have those capabilities when, when we, we really don't. There's also something that, that is a little more ominous, the gambler's fallacy or the normalized deviance, is that as UAPs show up more often, more frequently in airspaces, creating hazards, we don't really know what we're dealing with, but we've normalized it now. And we, we say, okay, we're going to continue to allow this to happen and yet there may be something ominous on the other side that we really should be addressing. And that, that's really, I think, one of the reasons why most of us right now want to continue to see things, uh, get a look at the data, try to understand what it means, determine if there's agency behind it. Um, and we do have some tools for that. And, and that gets back to your objective is how do I give advice to someone in the cockpit who sees something flying straight at him or 50 feet away? What, what should we do? based on past behaviors that we've seen or interpreted to uh, not engage in a, in a safety hazard. Coyus Institute is a pioneer in the field of AI-driven comparative and qualitative analysis and was established with the primary goal of uncovering the hidden value left behind in complex data sets. Through a combination of human expertise and cutting-edge technologies, Coyus has developed a range of services that cater to various industries. They are providing valuable insights that can help drive growth, formulate competitive strategy, and to identify key patterns in targeted demographics. Head to their site to learn more, coyos.institute. That's C-O-E-U-S dot institute. Dr. Michael Lembeck, thank you for joining me here in the Merge Podcast. Thanks for having me, Ryan. We've been uh, collaborating together at the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. How long have you been there now? Uh, well, with AIAA since I was in college way oh. back when, but uh, working with you now, about, uh, coming up on a year. Awesome. Very cool. Uh, we'll talk more about uh, what the UAP Integration Committee uh, that we lead is doing. Uh, but first, I'd like to learn a little bit more about you and learn how you kind of came up in the industry, in the aerospace industry. So sure. um, perhaps we can start with where you went to school and what you majored in and where you went after that. Yeah, well, started out in Peoria, Illinois. Mm. And uh, my dad was a newspaper editor of the local paper there. Mm. So when I was a kid, he'd bring home all the wire stories and photos of the early American astronauts. And by first grade, I was hooked. Mm. I had to go do it. So started looking around uh, eventually for colleges that support aerospace engineering. And Illinois was in my backyard in Champaign-Urbana. So uh, took uh, four years to go through there and stayed around for my master's degree. And uh, then went out to work at JPL. Uh, Jet Propulsion Lab? Yep, in California. Uh, worked on the Galileo program that went to Jupiter. I dropped a probe in the atmosphere and took some pictures. Not uh, Avi Loeb's Galileo project. No, this is uh, the original Galileo. Well, the second Galileo. Okay. After, <laughs> after the one with two legs. Uh, but Galileo spent a couple of years in orbit at Jupiter before it was uh, summarily dismissed into the atmosphere of Jupiter just in case it had any germs on it. We didn't mm -hmm. want it landing it on Europa and causing some new life forms there. What would you say your role was with that? Uh, I worked in the Add2 control system area so in the test team. We uh, developed one of the first closed-loop test systems where we mm. put the satellite out on a table where it's nice and flat and simulate uh, the environment around it, uh, flashlights for stars and the sun, okay. uh, trick out the gyros to make them think they're flying in space. And it was one of the first times the technology had become available in computers to do that quickly enough uh, but mm -hmm. it reduced the risk quite a bit in terms of flying spacecraft after that. Interesting. And this was, was this your first kind of major responsibility out of, out of college, first project? Yep. Very cool. Um, where did you, where'd you go after that? Uh, after that, uh, I went back and got my PhD at Illinois and uh, did some consulting work along the way uh, for various companies uh, that uh, 
meant I didn't have to eat ramen noodles all the time in school, which was good. <laughs> uh, and then uh, ended up at a little company called Space Industries in Houston, Texas. Uh, Max Vigier and Cadwell Johnson were the fathers of the American space program. Hmm. They designed everything from Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and the shuttle. And after they retired from NASA, they started this little company down there to do commercial space, a term that no one knew what that meant just What yet. year is this? This would be uh, about 1992. Oh, wow. Pre-internet. Yeah. No, yeah. No cell phones, no nothing like that. And uh, the original intent was to build a uh, small man-tended space station, the Industrial Space Facility, or ISF. Mm. And uh, it soon became clear that uh, NASA wanted their own space station. And while NASA offered a free launch for our module, uh, there was a lot of antibodies in the system that eventually made it clear that the ISF was not going to be. And At this point, there really was – NASA wasn't working with any major um, platform provider at this point. Everything was mostly internal, internal for the rocket. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah, everything was being developed, uh, and the space station had gone through several iterations, Space Station Freedom, uh, International Space Station, and so forth. Uh, but this is all pre-space station launch, and there was still a need uh, for doing something up there. So our founders figured out that, well, that wasn't going to be. They needed other things to bring in revenue. And uh, one of the first projects they got was with the University of Houston, the, the uh, Space Vacuum Epitaxy Center there. This are the what? Space Vacuum Epitexy Center. Okay, what's that? Uh, so uh, what you're doing there, back around 1995, 96 time frame, we were still on single core computers. Mm. And the way to make computers faster was to eliminate the impurities in the substrates that the computers were made on, the silicon mm. chips. And so the University of Houston had this idea of taking a large dislike structure to space, letting it kind of scrape out whatever residual atoms are still up there, and in that wake behind this circular disk, looked like a flying saucer, by the way. Hmm. Uh, in this wake behind the disk, we took gallium and arsenide and sprayed it onto a substrate and made these really pure disks of gallium arsenide. Hmm. Now, within a year of that, the Israelis, IBM, uh, figured out that, oh, wait a minute, you want to make computers go faster? How about multiple cores? Hmm. And so that whole multi-core thing came about and kind of took the, the wind out of the sails of what Houston was doing at that time. Very interesting. Uh, we also built something called the uh, Commercial Refrigeration Incubation Module. It was a refrigerator uh, and, and incubator that flew on the space shuttle starting mm -hmm. in STS-49, and it uh, was enabling for doing things like protein crystal growth studies. We were able to uh, provide an environment that was stable in temperature to within a tenth of a degree in microgravity so that these crystals could grow much larger. You could then bring them down to Earth after they've been stabilized and de from determine their X-ray structure uh, much better than you could do from crystals that were being built in the ground that would suffer from breakage caused by convection mm. inside the, the samples. That's fascinating. You know, people might not realize, but one of the ways that we create uh, our extremely hardened fan blades in our jet engines for modern fighters are through crystallized uh, mineral growth to uh, reduce um, errors and vacancies and things of that nature in the materials. So you said this was 92 they were looking to do this. This is pretty early on trying to perfect that technology. Right. Interesting. Yeah, we were doing a lot. And we actually, the control system for that incubator was a fuzzy logic controller. Hmm. It was actually the first implementation of artificial intelligence to fly in space. Oh, wow. So um, I developed that, and uh, it managed to, without retuning the payload every time, we could take solid metal or water, didn't matter what kind of thermal uh, situation there was, and it would hold it to within a tenth of a degree without retuning. So it was a pretty enabling device for a lot of that early uh, investigations that were going on in that area. Very cool. You worked at NASA, yes? Yep. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you got into NASA and what you did there? Well, I uh, passed through Space Industries and Orbital Sciences Corporation mm -hmm. uh, and uh, spent a little time there developing the remote sensing systems for Orbital. Okay. And at the end of that time, after we launched those systems, I was looking around for something else to do, and uh, there was an opening at NASA headquarters that I was made aware of that there was going to be a new impetus moving forward in exploration. Hmm. So this was about the end of 2003, and I went up there and uh, joined the systems engineering group, helped write some documentation, and then Rear Admiral Craig Steidel came on the scene right about that time and led the Exploration Systems Mission Directorate. Hmm. And uh, Craig brought me in as his Requirements Division Director. So we set about with a team of uh, 12 people that we had brought up from the field centers to headquarters. Uh, we put them in an area we called the Swamp. <laughs> 
And we started to develop all the requirements for what you now see as Artemis and, uh, and, Orion, and the Orion program and such. Uh, this was back previously called the Constellation program, but we took a look at what it would take to go back to the moon and eventually onto Mars. We laid that out in three spirals. So the first step was to get our skills back together. We hadn't built anything in a long time, so get back to low Earth orbit mm -hmm. uh, and uh, get a capsule that would do that in a very safe system. We had several astronauts that uh, had seen what had happened on Columbia and Challenger and wanted a, an ultra safe system. So mm -hmm. we took a step backwards and addressed what that would look like. We're also looking for common systems between the, the crew capsule and uh, the payload systems that would carry like lunar landers and the like. So we did all of those trade studies to figure out what the best steps forward would be, uh, worked up the requirements and delivered them to Admiral Steidel. And um, about that time, that was the uh, end of the first Bush administration. Hmm. And there was a changeover in administrators around that time. And uh, once again, it's time to look for another job and uh, moved out of there to uh, back to Houston. Back to Houston? Yeah, it went uh, down to, uh, as uh, some people have called it, spend your time in the barrel. <laughs> with a small little entrepreneurial group down there okay. that uh, didn't pan out in the long term. Uh, but ultimately, uh, that put me in a position to uh, work then with the Boeing company and uh, got involved with them working on the uh, first, the, the Ryan competition, which Lockheed Martin eventually prevailed in, but then later on the commercial crew vehicle that uh, Boeing's currently developing called hmm. the Starliner. Fascinating. So you've been basically involved in kind of trying to open up the commercial space industry, it sounds like, from the very beginning of your career. Yeah. Um, do you have any reflections or, or thoughts about how you've seen the industry develop right now with SpaceX and some of the other players coming into it? Uh, well, actually, I had a hand uh, helping Elon as well early on. We uh, went down to visit his plant, uh, and uh, spent some time at the uh, LAX Marriott where he was trying to figure out uh, how to lower the cost of access to space. Mm -hmm. And originally he wanted to put uh, two little landers on Mars with a couple of mice in them for goodwill, uh, <laughs> I guess. Goodwill, not for the mice. And, uh, and of course, he found, soon found out that uh, the cost of doing that was just not going to be feasible for him. Uh, and so he started looking around for other places to go and uh, eventually determined that the only way to do it would be to develop a vertically integrated capability, which is now SpaceX. Mm. And uh, the rest is history, as they say. He's been very successful at pulling that together. And it was a real pleasure to see how he got that started and you know, moved forward with an idea, stuck to it, and became successful. Was there much collaboration between NASA and SpaceX in those early days? Yeah, there, there actually was in the sort of the CFO, COO office. Um, the on the SpaceX side? On the, on the NASA side. Okay. Uh, there was a real desire to try to get some of these companies started and provide uh, benefits to them. Uh, so we'd buy data. So if you're a, a launch vehicle provider, someone new in the business, we'd uh, develop a contract with you and try to buy that data from you so NASA could learn about what works and what doesn't work. Hmm. And in doing so, spawn these new industries and businesses moving forward. Awesome. We're seeing that to some degree now, I would say. Yeah, there, there's some of that, but there's also uh, like a really big barrier to entry. I, I tell my students this little example that's uh, kind of entertaining at times. If you had a Dragon capsule from SpaceX and it's able to uh, carry and return about 3,000 kilograms of material, if you carried 3,000 kilograms of lead to orbit and you met Merlin the Magician there and you asked Merlin to turn that to gold and come back down, you would still lose money on the mission, hmm. quite a bit of money oh. in the millions. And so uh, what that tells us is that whatever you build in space is going to have to have more value than a precious metal. Hmm. And uh, you know, that's, that's really the, the point that uh, a lot of people overlook, just coming up with ideas of where they want to go. But you know, I think pharmaceuticals, uh, fiber optic cable that's used in uh, microsecond trading and things like that, those things clearly have an advantage and can only be made in orbit. Uh, and that, that's where I hope that a lot of the focus will be in these initial business cases. Hmm. Any other examples of, of uh, business areas or technologies that make more sense for manufacturing in space? Uh, well, there's a company called Lambda that's developing a uh, artificial retina. Hmm. Uh, it's made up of a number of layers of materials, and in order to get those layers perfectly square, uh, you go to zero gravity so you don't have any convective or forces like that uh, working against you. So uh, the pharmaceuticals, um, there is a lot of talk about servicing, satellite servicing, uh, but I've not yet seen the business case that says just go launch the new thing. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's ma- basically driven by the fact that technology is moving so quickly. If you put up a camera today, just imagine what that's going to look like three years from now. Yeah. I mean, our iPhone cameras are being updated every year uh, with tremendous technology. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, it's difficult to make a case to you know, refuel something when the payload itself is what's uh, needing you know, updating. So then where do you see the industry going? Do you feel like there'll just be a, a, a continuation of investment in technologies that don't necessarily move our ability to travel space forward that much? Or do you think that there will be, you know, there are things in the hopper that will help enable us to move past those limitations that you just said, such as, you know, traditional fuel systems? Yeah, I think there are some things that take naturally take advantage of the space environment. Uh, for instance, uh, power. You know, there's unlimited solar power there. Well, today, data centers on the ground here are chewing up somewhere, depending on who you talk to, 5 and 10% of the global power that we have available to us. Why not move those data centers to space mm-hmm. where power is readily available? We can, uh, you know, you have to move the data around anyway. We can use laser communications to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, the communication side, the attitude control side, that's not going to change much over 10 years, but the computers will. So if you have slices that you can pull out and put in the new slice, mm-hmm. you could have a data center that's updatable on orbit that uh, could also help out the planet by reducing the power requirements yeah and there's you know there's a lot of power requirements that go into cooling uh, these systems as well which you'd have advantage in space i imagine as well you still have exactly. to remove the heat away but you'd have more of a differential and easier time doing it All right. space tourism you know i think that's coming along we just saw yesterday virgin galactic flew again uh you know bezos company and um uh the, the new shepherd has flown a couple of times now and uh, will continue to do so uh, people are intrigued. It's, uh, at one point in my NASA career, I was uh, leading a deb- NPR debate down in Philadelphia, and we had a couple of people from industry. One was pro-astronauts, uh, the other was pro-robots, basically. And No other side. Uh, no, there's no other <laughs> side. And I asked the, the pro-robot guys, uh, you know, if he ever went on vacation. He says, yeah, sure, I might go on vacation. <laughs> That's a good question. Really? Um, you mean you don't just want to sit in front of a computer and the Internet and look at pictures of Antigua or, you know, somewhere in the Caribbean? You have to go there and experience it? Why is that? You know, and of course, he was dumbfounded and didn't have an answer for it. But <laughs> that's why we go. We, we are, as human beings, like to explore, and I think we'll continue to do so. When I think of space, uh, and you can tell me where I'm wrong here, but um, starting above my head, I think of it in a few categories. I think of like below like a few thousand feet where you have drones and bugs and birds and certain hazards, right? Um, And you get a little bit higher, you're in an area where there are uh, commercial airliners and things of that nature. They're either climbing or descending or transiting at slower speeds because they're down lower. You have your your bug smashers, as we call them, with Cessnas and things of that nature that Mm -hmm. say below 18,000 feet. Then above 18,000 feet, you have Class A airspace. Uh, and that's where your commercial airliners transit the country at. And typically, they're not going to be any higher than about 40,000 feet. Uh, and most non-specially made military aircraft are going to stay probably somewhere in that vicinity as well. And then there's a lot of space, and perhaps you can tell me somewhere near the number of feet, uh, but between that 40,000 feet and what we would consider low Earth orbit. Mm-hmm. Um, do we use that space for anything right now? There are uh, high altitude aircraft, uh, you know, at uh, the U2s, for instance, the WB 72 uh, gets up there to do remote sensing reconnaissance. Um, there is a new class of satellites that are coming in called very low Earth orbit satellites. Uh, those are satellites that will travel below about 300 kilometers. Is that your transition phase typically between? Well, Leo it, d- and it depends on what your purpose is in calling the transition between alt- atmosphere and space. Got it. Uh, for instance, if I'm a space tourist, yesterday they didn't quite get to 62 miles. Got it. <laughs> but they strapped themselves to a stick of dynamite, so I call them an astronaut. Sure. They get credit. <laughs> uh, 62 miles is kind of the area that we, we have demarked and, and say above that, you're an astronaut. Uh, but clearly, you're not going to be in orbit. You, mm-hmm. the, the friction of the air that's still up there would be too high to uh, be able to, for a vehicle to travel at orbital velocities through there. So you've got to travel up a little higher to about 250, 300 kilometers, where there's not quite as many molecules. But there's enough there that if you stayed there without any propulsion, you would reenter within a couple of days. It would drag you down. Right. Mm-hmm. And so these new very low Earth orbit satellites are starting to look like uh, bats, actually. They have... 
uh, almost what look like lifting surfaces. Mm. Uh, their solar panels are extended, so they, they work like lings. They have an angle of attack. And they usually use some sort of uh, electric or low-thrust propulsion to maintain their orbit. But the advantage is huge for but them. They are in orbit. They are in orbit. Mm -hmm. But And the advantage is huge for them from the standpoint that being lower, the optics, if they're a remote sensing satellite, can be much smaller for a given resolution than, say, up at 600 kilometers. Uh, so you don't need as much mass. That means your launch vehicle doesn't have to be quite as potent. So your cost to orbit is coming down. Mm. So there's a trade there that can be made to say, you know, is this an appropriate use or application at that altitude? And really, it sounds like there's a, a fine line between how much energy this system can create and how much it needs to expend in order to operate in thicker atmosphere. Right. Um, and so presumably, if you had... Um, the ability to generate more energy, you'd be able to perform those maneuvers at lower altitudes where the air is thicker. Perhaps not significantly, but right. it would be a sliding scale, essentially. Right. And, and the trade, there's a thermal trade there, too, because the lower you go, the more surface heating you're going to get mm -hmm. in the atmosphere that you'd have to dissipate. And so right now, I think, you know, the 250, 300 is about the limit. 350 is what we typically say you're going to reenter within a couple of weeks mm -hmm. if you don't have propulsion. And so most of the satellites we build at Illinois have been uh, launched out of the space station, about 425 kilometers, mm -hmm. and we'll get about a one-year lifetime out of that altitude. Got it. So really below that, though, you'd be looking at some type of um, buoyancy lifting device, like a, like a weather balloon or something of that nature, right. would that be, unless you had some type of specially designed like jet aircraft that could operate at those higher altitudes. Right. Um, so there's a limitation for jet aircraft operating at high altitudes because uh, jet engines uh, rely on air from the atmosphere, oxygen from the atmosphere, in order to combust uh, the fuel. But we're working to extend that limit right now, mm -hmm. you know, with uh, uh, significant improvements in the intercoolers that are being built that take the incoming air. You know, we're bringing it from whatever speed we're at, Mach 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and slowing it down to zero mm. so that we can burn some fuel in it and then accelerate it back out the tailpipe. Interesting. Um, there's uh, reaction engines in the UK. They now have a test facility in Colorado Springs, mm. uh, are working to develop that kind of uh, system where it's essentially a rocket plane. You're, you're still using rocket fuel, but oxygen from the atmosphere in order to operate at that higher altitude. Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm trying to get at, so well, that, no, that's a good point. Um, but so there's a, there's a limitation to a technology limitation to how how high we can go and still fly aggressively, essentially, right? Because right. we need to really push things around, and it's hard to control an aircraft at those altitudes as well. Because again, the air is thicker, and our control surfaces are designed so that we are pushing against that thick air in order to move our aircraft. So the less thick the air is, the less controllability we have, unless you compensate uh, with speed. Right. Uh, and so there, there's a dance there. Uh, but, and that's that's one type of technology that allows us to operate, I would say, below LEO, but above, say, 40,000 feet. Uh, weather balloons, s s I'll call them adversarial spy balloons, things of that nature, it seems those do operate at those higher altitudes as well. Um, mm -hmm. The one that was recently, um, that flew over the continental United States and was shot down, I believe it was at 100 or 120,000 feet. Right. Um, so there does seem to be traffic moving in that space. Do, do you know from a, a policy standpoint who really owns that airspace? Well, technically, uh, there's a zone that come, extends from your borders to space that you control. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone recognizes that. Uh, whether or not you can reach them with surface air missiles or, or other activity to protect that and actually own that airspace is another question, mm -hmm. of course. Now, I would think that there could be a potential risk to um, to space operations if there are uh, unregistered balloons or objects that are operating at these much higher altitudes that were traditionally not looking for adversarial platforms or, or aircraft. Um, but I imagine that, you know, as we increase our access to space, that airspace is going to have to be more tightly controlled because we are going to be transiting it more often. Um, and, okay. I don't know where to go yeah. with this. We can cut if we need to. But... Um, that's where I was trying to explore that space and kind of see if we understood who operates there, who's in control of it, and is it as much yeah. of a, a Wild West as I might think it is? Because from my perspective, it seems to be. Well, I think so, and, and part of the reason it is a Wild West is that for a while, our sensors have been dialed down. We've looked for things that operate at high speeds, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, like ballistic missiles would be penetrating the atmosphere from coming in from the other side of the planet. Yeah. Uh, so things that are low and are high and slow uh, we haven't really viewed as a threat 
until recently. Mm -hmm. And so our filter has been dialed back. We haven't seen anything there. Um, and now we're being a little more cautious and we're looking for those things. And I think we're starting to see more of it. Hmm. As I continue my walk out, uh, out of the airspace above my head, uh, we're now in Leo. We've talked about some cool technology there. I think data centers are a great idea. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps even uh, a, a, um, a, a energy um, beaming station, perhaps, being mm -hmm. able to gather uh, solar energy and then transmit that to Earth uh, is another potential Leo application, perhaps, that would depend on the limitation of how much energy or the efficiency of the transfer, I would imagine. Right. Um, but regardless, there's, there's, that, there's a space there is becoming increasingly competitive, I would say. Um, and also dangerous because the more uh, objects we have in space, the more ch chance that we, we run into a catastrophic runaway situation where um, we start essentially creating too much trash in space to be able to operate. Could you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, uh, the Kessler effect is what you're talking mm -hmm. about. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Kessler figured out that if we start to put too much stuff up there uh, and that is becomes uncontrolled and turns into debris, that uh, it'll start ricocheting off and perhaps set up a chain reaction ultimately that could lead to uh, catastrophic uh, cluttering of space. Just surrounded by a bunch of trash. Yeah, I mean, space we, trash. we've seen the movies, Gravity and, and such, where that kind of gets started that way. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a real concern, and uh, not only from, from the standpoint of debris and, you know, making it impossible for us to get through from lower atmosphere to the extended reaches of space, um, but it's starting to impact everyday life here on Earth for some scientists, for instance, mm. astronomers. Uh, with so many satellites in orbit, they're seeing satellite tracks go through their fields of view while they're doing research. Mm. And uh, actually, a colleague of mine at Illinois and myself have been looking at this problem, trying to figure out how we can reduce it. Uh, it turns out that some of the astronomers are actually their own worst enemies because they're all going after their Nobel Prizes and such. And so they don't want to report where they're looking. Ah. And if we don't know where they're looking, we can't protect you from what the satellites are going through your field of view. Interesting. So it, it's an interesting level of secrecy there. Yeah, sort of a side problem there. but. It's, uh, there are things you can do with satellite design. You can feather the solar arrays as they come into the field of view so they don't reflect as much. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> those kind of factors are, are things we're looking at. Uh, darker black paint in the direction of uh, the ground so that you have uh, less reflections, uh, more specular reflections so that stuff doesn't just come straight back at you. It goes out the mm -hmm. sides and so forth. So we're looking at technologies that might be able to address that problem. Very cool. Even the Hubble Space Telescope has become uh, a victim of this now. As its orbit is decaying closer to the Earth, hmm. its field of view is starting to be interrupted by satellite tracks. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. So we continue out. We get to, I would just say, our average orbital distance, which I don't know what it is. I'm sure you could tell me. We go further out. We get the geostationary orbit where mm -hmm. uh, that represents a satellite staying over a, a, a single point over the ground because of the rotation relative velocities match. Um, after that, there's maybe something that's less well known, perhaps, and maybe you can describe what it is, and that would be the Lagrange point between the Moon and Earth. Why is that yeah. important? <clears throat> well, that's the point where uh, the gravity of the Sun and the gravity of the Earth Moon system balance out. And there are actually five, five such points that are arrayed sort of in a triangle around the Earth Moon system. Mm. Um, one of the projects I'm affiliated with right now at Illinois is called the Carruthers Geochrono Observer. Uh, my students just completed a payload that is going to be on that satellite. Uh, it will be launched sometime late in 24, early 25, and it will go out to L1, the, the L1, Lagrange the Grange point. Mm -hmm. uh, out there, it'll look back at the Earth's atmosphere, and there, the, believe it or not, pictures of the Earth's atmosphere, the extended glow of it, have only been taken five times. Hmm. And Carruthers was an Afro-American at Illinois in the mid-60s who happened to develop a camera that flew on Apollo 16, was placed on the moon, and took the first picture of oh. Earth's geochrono. Okay. Uh, so the mission's been named for him, and our payload is actually called the Carruthers Observatory Student Solar Monitor, COSMO. And so COSMO will look back towards the sun, and we'll take that data and collaborate with the main payload looking at the Earth's atmosphere and try to correlate what's going on there. Awesome. So it's a, it's a nice place to sit uh, because there's not many perturbations. You're sort of orbiting a point in space, mm -hmm. and it stays there and rotates in the orbit as the Earth rotates around the sun. So it's essentially almost like an invisible gravity well almost like there's a planet there you can orbit but there's nothing there exactly uh does that lead is that does that make access to the moon easier if you go through the Lagrange point uh 
Boy, that's a good question. I, uh, there's a, so many ways now to get to the moon. It's becoming uh, kind of an uh, 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 interesting thing mm-hmm. now for, for orbital mechanics to figure well, out. When I was a student, that was kind of like the, what was taught was that, you know, Grange points are an optimal point for efficiency of transfer between at least planetary bodies, perhaps not the moon, because the moon's a little bit closer, so we might be able to get away with a little bit. Um, well, actually, we did a study way back when uh, some students were looking at solar sails, mm-hmm. and they found that they could spiral out from the Earth orbit, get to a Lagrange point, and then from there go in any direction because mm-hmm. it was sort of a balancing act, and they didn't have to overcome the gravity of getting out of that gravity well. But uh, in terms of going to the moon, um, of course, Hohmann transfer is probably the most propellant, well, one of the most propellant efficient ways to get there. It takes about three days from perigee to perigee. Uh, but now there's some new categories of orbits where we kind of slingshot them, just kind of throw them around the side and mm-hmm. let it kind of slide in. It can take weeks to get there. If you're not in a rush, a little more efficient. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, uh, the Indian mission that just launched uh, last week is uh, on that t- kind of tra- trajectory, I believe. Um, the Russians launched last night another uh, thing to the moon, to the, the South Pole. I'm not sure what trajectory that's on, but mm-hmm. uh, probably similar. Because uh, the, the game, name of the game is to get the more mass that you can get to the surface, the better off, the more science you're going to do. Mm-hmm. So if I can trade the propellant mass for the payload mass, I'm doing way better. And uh, orbital mechanics are the guys figuring that out. Mm. You know, that was my next point is that, you know, there's a lot of private companies and, and nations going back to the moon. Mm-hmm. Are you aware of any of the, the interesting projects that might be looking to go back to the moon in the near future? Uh, there are a couple uh, rovers that are going to set down at the South Pole. Uh, one of the things that the moon is known for at the South Pole is water ice. That's a deeply shadowed area that for, has been that way for millennia. Shadowed, you said? Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, it's hard to see from our sensors what you're applying. It's hard to see, but also the sun doesn't illuminate it. Okay. So any water ice that's been delivered by other meteors or comets to those areas are probably frozen and embedded in the sidewalls of mm. those craters. And what's water? Hydrogen and oxygen. Yeah. What's that? Rocket fuel. fuel. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, if we can, uh, you get drinking water, you get air for your base, mm-hmm. and you get propellant for moving back and forth from orbit to the base. Yep. So all those things are good if we can get there, and that's what these first set of uh, robots are designed to do. Mm-hmm. Do you have thoughts on competition between China and the U.S. going back to the moon? Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think we all do, right? Yeah. Uh, certainly, I think it's important for the United States to maintain a, a vigorous program uh, to show that our way of life uh, results in uh, really good results in the science, uh, social skills, and, and uh, our industries. Uh, so I think it's important that our government uh, supports and, and extends support uh, to these programs. Uh, And then it becomes a question of what's the most efficient way to get there. Should the government internalize these programs or should we buy services? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we found over time now we've – the government educated a number of companies over the last 60 years on how to develop space things. Uh, SpaceX is is probably in a position with Starship to uh, go and land there. Uh, Blue Origin will be soon as well. Uh, so why not buy the services from the companies that have been trained with our technologies and, uh, and maybe we can do it cheaper and mm-hmm. better and faster? I wonder, if we go back to the moon and we, we, we beat China back there and we set up a base, um, and China was to beat us on, on uh, global leadership on the UAP topic, which one do you think mm-hmm. would be more important? That's a very good question, Ryan. Um, I think as it stands today, uh, it's probably getting to the moon first because that's the one that's most overtly visible. Mm. And that's the one that everyone is aware of and and, uh, paying attention to. Now, through your efforts and others, that may change in the near future, where as we learn more about UAP and uh, what they're up to, that emphasis and priority may change very Mm. rapidly. Interesting. Um, Let's talk about, you know, we've gone all the way up to the moon now. You've you've been at NASA. We'll go back to your career just momentarily here. Um, where'd you go after NASA? Uh, so after NASA, I did a little consulting, developed my own company, uh, got bought out, uh, did a little more consulting, and then about five years ago, decided to give back a little and landed at the University of Illinois. You like that school, huh? Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, you know hometown. Uh, yeah. It's cool to so, have be able to keep going back to that you know that same place yeah. throughout your life. That must be nice. Well, I'd been on the alumni board for thirty years, oh, so wow. I was familiar with the programs there. Had uh, provided some guidance along the way. 
uh, Philippe Gabel, the department head at the time, uh, engaged me in some conversations about whether I'd be interested in uh, th- there was some view towards developing sort of a uh, uh, what's called a clinical position, uh, it's a professor of practice, where folks from industry come back and give back uh, with their knowledges of how industry works, a little mm-hmm. more firsthand experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, so myself and another colleague of mine, Jason Merritt, uh, who teaches aircraft design, came back from Gulfstream at the same time. So he teaches aircraft design, I teach spacecraft design, and it's uh, it's uh, very rewarding for the students for us to be able to transfer our information that we've gathered over time, plus our contacts. So, you know, I've got a Rolodex a mile long, yeah. and uh, when students need help with jobs or you know interviews and that sort of thing, I can hopefully help them out. Awesome. How many students do you have now? Uh, in my research group, I have about eight grad students. Uh, we have about 25 undergrads working in our Laboratory for Advanced Space Systems at Illinois, or LASSI. And then uh, in my design class this year, we'll have 100 students oh. taking the senior spacecraft design class. Very cool. Uh, what kind of projects do your grad students work on? Or, you know, your, your undergrads might work on them, too. I don't want to cut them out. Yeah, well, the, the way we set it up in our lab is we actually have an undergraduate course, which is the portal for working in the lab. And awesome. we pair up the undergraduates with the graduate students okay. so they can work on the flight projects after they, they get enough experience. We train them how to solder. Uh, all of the safety things working in the lab, uh, that, that all gets uh, handed over to them in the first semester. Mm-hmm. And then uh, they have become very productive. So uh, we actually, I, I reached out, I've started an outreach program to kind of develop a pipeline of students to come into our department from high schools. Mm-hmm. So we've worked with the 4-H extension system at Illinois to develop what we call an engineering development unit. It's a small satellite emulator using a Raspberry Pi, and we're going to put 12 of these in high schools this fall, and students will be able to develop their own little CubeSat and a payload. And uh, we're going to have a competition, and the best idea that they come up with for a payload, we're going to try to find space for them. So it's pretty exciting, and it it draws those students to us uh, so that they can help us out. Uh, Once they get there, uh, of course, they have the basics they've got to learn, and and for those first two years, Mm -hmm. it's kind of trying to get to the fun engineering stuff. So we've worked with the DOD on a grant uh, to develop something called our Vertically Landed Rocket Challenge. And what that is is we take a model rocket, uh, put a gimbal system in the base of it, and we carry it up to 60 feet on a Hollywood drone, and then release it. The engine ignites, and we try to set down vertically on the ground, much like the SpaceX Falcon. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've run two competitions. We'll have another one this coming October. Uh, students from Purdue, from Southern Illinois University, from Illinois State University, and Illinois itself uh, went out and competed. And, uh, you know, we're able to see their rockets fall and tumble. And, you know, even one of them landed upright. So oh, it, it, was, it was pretty <laughs> exciting to, to watch that. Cool. And then uh, w- once they uh, get through that undergraduate area, we get into our grad school research, and we're doing a couple of uh, I call flagship uh, projects right now. Uh, one of them is for Fermilab uh, in northern Illinois. They are doing a search for dark matter, and they have an idea that there's a uh, particle called a sterile neutrino that, uh, when it decays, gives off a 3.5 kilo electron volt X-ray. And so they have developed something called a Skipper CCD, which will look for those X-rays. And we're putting it on a satellite and uh, going out hunting for dark matter. Now, the big challenge there is that the sensor is cryogenic. Mm. So to get something down to 170 degrees Kelvin, you know, below liquid nitrogen temperatures, on a small satellite that's the side of two loaves of bread. It's not going to be small anymore. It's a big challenge. <laughs> yeah. so, so we actually got a cryo cooler out of a heat-seeking mm. missile. Oh, very cool. And uh, it's about the size of a radio control airplane internal combustion motor, about the mm. size of my fist. And we have uh, used that, and uh, one of my grad students, Eric Alpine, is working to get that, uh, uh, mitigate all the risks in the thermal control system so we can achieve those temperatures, and he's had pretty good success. Very cool. And uh, he'll be coming up on his qualification exam soon, so hopefully uh, he'll convince his jury that uh, he's done really good work there. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Uh, the other principal project we've got, uh, we're working with Jet Propulsion Lab in California on a quantum experiment. Mm-hmm. It's called SEEK. Uh, and SEEK is uh, twofold. One is to do quantum entanglement in space, and the other is to develop uh, hardware that is space tolerant. So if we're going to develop quantum communications, for instance, we need receivers that uh, will tolerate cosmic rays coming in and, and causing damage to them. These are just little crystalline structures, uh, photodiodes, much like the little sensor on your lamppost that uh, detects when the sun's up mm-hmm. and down and turns your light on and off. 
But these are sensitive to single photons. Mm. So obviously they're very sensitive, and if a cosmic ray comes through and damages the structure, the noise ratio comes up and they're not good after a mm. while. Uh, so Paul Quiot in our physics department and uh, Thomas Genowine up at University of Waterloo have this idea of quantum annealing, where we shine a high-powered laser into the crystalline structure, kind of make it bubble up in energy, and then quench it very rapidly, much like uh, those engine blades you were talking yeah. about previously. Um, and when we quench it, then all the atoms drop into place, the noise is reduced, and they're back to normal. Mm -hmm. cool. So that'll fly to the space station in March. Uh, our students are currently putting the finishing touches on that in our clean room today. And uh, we're looking forward to getting those results out next summer. Very cool. That's awesome. So tell me, how did... All right, so now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, you've been okay. you've been in the aerospace industry for a long time. Um, I don't know whether in that time or not the topic of UAP has, has broached your interest at all. Yeah. So um, we'll talk a little bit We'll go into this in a second about how we're engaging that topic now, you and I, but do you have any experience in this topic before uh, you've engaged with me? Yeah, um, two experiences I can relate to you. Uh, one of them was uh, one of the programs that we had at Space Industries was the Comet program, uh, which would put small payloads in space and recover them later on. And as part of that, uh, we worked with some folks uh, on the rocket that included Deke Slayton, uh, the former astronaut at the time and had lunch with him during one of those uh, events, and he told us about a uh, metallic object that he was chasing in an F-86. Mm. Came up behind it, uh, this is probably circa 1956 or so. Uh, came up behind it, and uh, it matched pace, and then just took off at a blinding speed. He said he had no idea what it was, but he knows it wasn't ours. Hmm. That, this was that before was he was an astronaut when he was in the Air Force? Right. Yeah, wow. Yep. And then he told me the story after he w had left the, the Corps. Mm -hmm. So that, that was kind of interesting. And then um, probably about five years ago, six years ago, uh, I was outdoors in Houston uh, on a rooftop patio looking north into downtown with a friend of mine from Boeing and uh, an astronaut. And we were just having some conversations when four lights appeared over North Houston. Uh, they were sort of orangish, like a sodium vapor color. They flickered into you know, existence there. And then a fifth one appeared. And uh, right after the fifth one appeared, the four that were there previously flickered back out. Um, initially, I thought they were flares, but they weren't dropping at all. They maintained their altitude. But then that fifth one uh, put the icing on the cake. It just went whew, at a high rate of speed across the horizon, hmm. like nothing we were seeing. The astronaut turned to me and said, well, that's interesting, <laughs> <laughs> in a very low-key manner. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I have no idea what that was. Uh, I don't think any of us did, but that certainly uh, was intriguing. And, hmm. uh, and being an aerospace engineer, the idea of having advanced propulsion, advanced capabilities to do exploration or, or otherwise has always been intriguing. So uh, it's had my interest for a long time. One of the things that people talk about a lot is like, you know, it's ours or it's a foreign adversaries or it's something else. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any any knowledge that you could share that indicates that we have some type of, you know, hidden technology that NASA and within the DOD that is uh, magnitude greater uh, propulsion or kinematic technology than what we use now? I mean, that's, you know, that's a question I get asked a lot. That's yep. a question a lot of people have. I mean, is that something that you've seen evidence of? Uh, that's what we call the blue, red, green problem. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> the blue is it's ours. Uh, red, it's an adversary and green comes from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's difficult to say. Um, th these capabilities right now without uh, any evidence of lifting services or propulsion, it's really intriguing on how you could do that. Mm -hmm. Um, assuming it's not an optical illusion, and I trust that the sensors we've had, your eyeballs, um, are, you know, while we have a lot of biases and we have a lot of uh, issues with our, you know, eyeball sensors, uh, when you get multiple sensors on target, I think that's something that becomes worthy of looking at. Mm -hmm. And uh, and right now, I just don't know of anything in our inventory that comes close to being able to match those capabilities. Mm -hmm. So for those that... I uh, don't know, uh, a few years ago, well, I guess it's about two and a half now, um, I was asked by some members of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics uh, to participate, and this was in 2021, I believe, uh, participate in a aviation 2021 conference as a speaker. And during that, or after that conference, myself and the other speakers 
uh, were brought aside and discussed would, on whether we'd be interested in helping the AIAA form a permanent uh, committee within the AIAA uh, around UAP or Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena. Uh, and we said yes, and we got the work. Um, and for the first eight months or so, we worked in secrecy. Uh, we weren't allowed to talk about the subject uh, outside of the group. And they were, we were under very clear instructions that if that was to happen and they were to hear about it, uh, the whole thing would be canceled. Um, and this was, you know, although it was only a few years ago, uh, it was a different time in this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that's that's how we operated for a good eight months, um, six to eight months. We then um, submitted our strategy and, and documentation to um, leadership within the AIAA, uh, and they formalized us as a UAP community of interest. And at this point, it's a semi-formal organization uh, that is on its way to becoming a, a full-fledged committee within uh, the AIAA, uh, essentially a, a full-ranking technical discipline within that organization. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we did. We started uh, socializing the idea. Now that we could uh, communicate it more publicly after the strategy was done, uh, we went out. We talked with members of the AIAA. We talked with uh, others within industry. Um, we started identifying problems, building up um, a team. Uh, and today we have uh, we have about 65 members. Uh, a lot, most are PhD and experts, subject matter experts in various fields. Uh, and our work is is gathered around two efforts, human factors and hardware factors. And those are two aviation safety terms uh, that uh, most, if not all, pilots will recognize. Uh, and I know I've spoken to them before, but very quickly, human factors is relating primarily to uh, ways we can improve the safety as it affects uh, the pilot or how they affect their environment. And hardware factors is related to how hardware and the equipment itself can help uh, prevent mishaps uh, and lead to safer outcomes or more mission success. And so uh, we're executing on those two, uh, those two subcommittees, primarily with a, a reporting bias on the human factors where we're looking to get some low-hanging fruit on uh, reporting mechanisms. Uh, and on the hardware factor side, our primary efforts around detection, characterization, and evaluation of these objects. Um, and so you you join this group. I'll, that's a quick you know aside into what this what this organization does. Um, as we, uh, I'll, I'll, just a couple more minutes. Apologize, I'll let you speak again. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's quite all right. We we eventually uh, held another conference uh, in 2022, scientific conference with papers, uh, and the organization was voted by the again the, the leadership of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics uh, to become a formal uh, full fledged committee at. Uh, this organization. So now you do have a, a UAP uh, integration committee at the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. It's the largest professional organization uh, for aerospace professionals. It's in 80 countries. Uh, and we have a group of, of technical subject matter experts that are going to be working on technical solutions for this problem space. And not only that, uh, we'll be looking to promulgate this information to the aerospace industry, both in terms of reporting, detection capabilities, uh, best practices, uh, we're going to have a, another conference, uh, a space-based conference uh, called Ascend this year in, in Las Vegas in October. Uh, if anyone would like to come, please do. Uh, we'll have two workshops, uh, or excuse me, we'll have two events going on. One will be a workshop relating to uh, sensing and detecting these objects. Uh, more of an open source work group where we'll be bringing others that are working on this together to discuss those best practices. Uh, and I'll also be hosting a panel where we'll be discussing uh, with some government stakeholders and others uh, about how we can move this conversation forward. Uh, so that's just a little background of um, what I've been doing on the technical side for the past couple of years. That's kind of a background for, for, for the listeners on what this, this technical organization is. Um, you, you joined this organization, and what, what brought you to the organization? Uh, well, I was looking through Twitter one day, and I saw an All AIAA piece. <laughs> And uh, there was this guy named uh, Ryan Graves who was looking for volunteers to come help uh, with NAIAA. Mm -hmm. And uh, that intrigued me. So I went to the website and tried to find out what you were doing, learned a little more background about uh, where you had come from and, and what you'd been up to. 
and uh, submitted my name and mm-hmm. thought, no, I'll never hear from him <laughs> <laughs> after that. But uh, later, I got an uh, email from you and did an interview with you and one of our uh, steering committee group leads. Mm-hmm. And uh, you invited me in the door, and I've uh, tried to, to have some sort of uh, impact and uh, help out best I can uh, since then. In your words, what, what are we trying to accomplish? What I think we're trying to accomplish is uh, probably two or threefold. Uh, one is to better understand what UAP is. Uh, clearly, there is something physical that is uh, coming into our airspace that appears to uh, occasionally be an aviation safety hazard. Uh, and so that, and a national security hazard, perhaps. Uh, we need to come to grips with that. What, what is uh, behind it? Uh, is it uh, increasing in frequency? Is there agency behind it? Uh, does it represent a threat? And uh, I think with AIAA, we're 30,000 strong subject matter experts. Uh, we bring to the table a, a lot of uh, capability in taking the program, taking UAP, and uh, just basically breaking it down into its elemental pieces and trying to understand it better. Mm. How, are, how are we doing that within the the IOC, or how are we planning to execute on that? Well, as you mentioned, the Hardware Factors Group is focused on detection, characterization, evaluation. Um, until you know what you're dealing with, can visualize it, uh, describe its performance, uh, there's not much more you can do with, without. And, and, and to that extent, we're kind of handicapped. We have our hands tied in that there's a fence between ourselves and a lot of that data. Mm-hmm. Currently, a lot of the data resides within the U.S. government and classified vaults. And so within the hardware factors group, we uh, originally thought we might get uh, some, you know, connection to the folks that are doing that work on the other side that hasn't matriculated yet. Uh, So we started to march down a path of, okay, what's out there today in the open? What can we get to? What are open source data uh, that we might detect UAP in? And so our members have been looking at uh, weather radars like NEXRAD. Uh, We've been looking at remote sensing imagery. Uh, We have an expert in cinematography and uh, deep fakes who can tell looking at a video whether or not it's a hoax or something that's real. And uh, and, and we started from first principles. Uh, We presented a paper uh, at the last uh, AAA conference in San Diego this summer on detection, uh, looking at the sensors and and what is it about UAP that we can detect. The... uh, Electromagnetic spectrum runs from, you know, kind of the deep blues to the the bright reds and beyond what our eyes can see. And UAP, uh, from what we can tell, don't show much of a signature in uh, in any of those areas. And so it's important to understand why that may or may not be. Down in the ultraviolet X-ray gamma ray region, the atmosphere is pretty opaque to those kinds of phenomena. Mm. So if they're using some high energy physics for propulsion, uh, that may be actually extinguished before it ever gets to one of our sensors. And that may be why we don't see anything. On the infrared side, you know, typically we're not, we're, we see objects in the FLIR, but they're not extremely hot or cold. Um, and it's not clear, again, you know, it's clearly not products of combustion that are propelling them through the air. So something else is at work to, to make them move the way they do. To speak theoretically, do you have any suggestions on what mechanisms that, those could be? No, the, the way I look at it is uh, it, it's kind of like I was uh, thinking about this on the way up here. You know, it's, it, the, this problem is very similar to teaching spacecraft design to students that haven't seen it before. Um, you're trying to convey new ideas, and, and we don't have any idea what it is. But I, I came up with this analogy that might be useful here. And that is, uh, there's actually an old kind of line about uh, giving Napoleon a B-52 at Waterloo. <laughs> We'd all be speaking French today if mm-hmm. that had happened. But imagine if we actually did drop a B-52 at Waterloo. Could the people at those time have actually understood what it was, how it worked? Could they have even figured out how to turn it on or what its capabilities were? And we may be dealing with something like that where it's just so far in front of us, technologically speaking, that we don't have a concept today or you know, an understanding of, of how it works and operates. It may require some new physics to figure that out. So yeah, that was going to be my question. Is this, you know, is this an engineering problem, a science problem, both? I mean, typically we uncover new scientific principles that lead to uh, engineering work that then results in us being able to capture some value from from that breakthrough. Um, 
But it's, hypothetically, if we had some type of highly technological device that came from elsewhere, it's potentially based on new science, potential, or undiscovered science, I should say, potentially not. So is that an engineering problem to, to work out those details, some combination it, of both? It really could be a cultural problem hmm. in that, uh, you know, w w as we developed, you know, there's been other sentient beings on the planet, dolphins and whales. They don't have anything mechanical that they play with, yet they appear to be conscious and communicate with each other and, and are able to do rudimentary things. Mm -hmm. um, we have developed as bipedal organisms to use our hands and, you know, build things. Uh, but that doesn't mean this is the only way that engineering can be accomplished. And so if, uh, if there's something else out there that uh, does not think the way, I mean, take a zombie, for instance. You know, zombies just like us, has arms and legs and body, gets around, it does things. But it doesn't have any agency, per se, about what it's trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So given that we don't know who the originators are of the technology, we don't know how advanced it is, what science they're using to develop it, it's not clear that we'll have an immediate understanding through an engineering sense of what these things are. Mm -hmm. I guess the same would apply on for science as well. If we were able to observe something and we would say, hey, this doesn't fit our model of the universe, we have to th therefore assume that it's based off of principles that we have yet to discover. Right. Um, would that same, same kind of thought process work on the scientific side? as far as uh, perhaps being exposed to problems that we just don't have the tools to bridge the gap? Again, I think it comes back to culture. If we step inside the cockpit of a jet, you and I would recognize a switch. We know it's toggling up and down. That's something that we've learned over time and that our engineers have developed to turn things on and off. But if there's another means of turning things on and off that we haven't thought about, would we understand it if we saw it mm -hmm. because of the way we've been brought up? So it's, it's possible if we're looking at a sphere, a smooth sphere, how do we get inside it? And there's no obvious latches, there's no rivets, there's no uh, any place to put your hand to open a latch or anything like that. It may be we just can't even get access to it yet. Mm -hmm. So I, I, it's the problem of, and, and uh, for those who are inside the fence, I'm probably saying some very foolish stuff because they may know more than I do mm -hmm. and, and could counter my arguments. But on the outside, without having any better data to look at right now, uh, I think everything's on the table. And to me, it looks like magic. And uh, only, you know, increasing our understanding of the science and the engineering involved and, and perhaps some of the culture, if we're lucky enough, will begin to understand what these things are. What do, we, what do we need as a culture to be able to understand this fully? I mean, is this something that we need to stand up new institutions that are focused on this particular study? Is this something that can get absorbed into a, our existing educational and uh, academic frameworks? Do you have any sense of that? Um, that's a good question, too. I think it comes back to the, the blue, red, green problem. If it's blue or red, then our culture is going to apply, right? We're, someone just cracked the code, but now they've applied everything they've learned. All the inertia of engineering is behind whatever mm -hmm. they've developed. So it's a pretty good chance we'll figure it out along those paths. If it's something else, though, that's where all my arguments about culture start coming into play. It may be an entirely different way of viewing things or operating things or engineering things that uh, it's going to be hard for us to decode. You know, one of the, the problems we have as engineers, particularly in the space program, is that there's 60 years of knowledge that have been built up about how things work properly and correctly. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to mess with that when you have human lives on the line. So there's a lot of inertia behind that. And that results in us using the same systems over and over again. And a lot in the space program is lacking innovation. And, and what I tell my students are they've got to bust that mold. They're, they're coming out with new ideas, new thoughts. They need to apply that and overcome this design inertia. Mm. And it may be that we need uh, something similar uh, when we approach UAP, is that we've had a lot of ideas of, about what they are. We have to kind of approach it with an open mind. Mm. And, and to do so, we have to also recognize our own internal biases of, of how we are subject to illusion and mis being misled by data. Um, you know, we, we have an optimism bias. I think uh, we'll, we always think, you know, every NASA budget is probably a good example of that. Uh, but, you know, we optimistically think we could solve this problem because we should have the basic root skills to do so. Um, we have... Uh, you know, something called the IKEA effect. You know, we value everything that we build ourselves more than anything else. And so, you know, we think we might have those capabilities when, when we, we really don't. Um, 
There's also something that, that is a little more ominous, and, and um, it's a term that was used for the, the challenger, uh, the gambler's fallacy or the uh, normalized deviance, is that as UAPs show up more often, more frequently in airspaces, creating hazards and aviation uh, issues, um, we don't really know what we're dealing with, but we've normalized it now. And we, we say, okay, we're going to continue to allow this to happen, and yet there may be something ominous on the other side that we really should be addressing. Mm -hmm. And that, that's really, I think, one of the reasons why most of us right now want to continue to see things, uh, get a look at the data, try to understand what it means, determine if there's agency behind it. Um, and we do have some tools for that, machine learning for instance, has made great strides in uh, playing games, for instance. Mm -hmm. So there are strategies and techniques that uh, objects in the games might do, and we can turn loose a computer on it and figure out how to beat those strategies. Mm -hmm. It's possible machine learning might be useful here, too, by observing some of the behaviors, the maneuvering. Uh, we may s begin to see patterns. And in those patterns, through uh, reinforcement learning, we can come to compensate for them. And, and that gets back to your objective is how do I give advice to someone in the cockpit who sees something flying straight at him or 50 feet away? What, what should we do based on past behaviors that we've seen or interpreted to uh, not engage in a, in a safety hazard? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we have some techniques that we can try, uh, but we have to be aware of the biases that are evident right in front of us as well as, as we move forward. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a tricky conversation because we've been baking biases into AI, and we, I don't think we've figured out necessarily the solution for getting rid of those human biases in AI. That's right. So, you know, one of the things that we've been looking at at, at the UAP IOC um, is what other what data sources exist. And, of course, we think about uh, space or ground-based sensor systems. Um, are you aware of uh, various space or ground-based uh, data providers that are either looking into us or that could be relevant for this conversation? Yeah, I think there's a, a number of folks out there that are starting to realize that they may have uh, things in their data that would be of interest to us. Uh, of course, all of the remote sensing folks out there, particularly the high-resolution systems, uh, could be of interest. Uh, there are also, um, I'll call it radio sensing systems in orbit that are uh, currently looking for, you know, where is the radio traffic, who's talking to each other, you know, the cartels uh, communicating from Mexico to somebody, where is that happening and how does the government uses that data to shut it down? But that is a commercial service that's available that we could go out and purchase as well. E is this, would this be defined as ELINT? Yes. Okay, electronic, electronic intelligence. Electronic intelligence, yeah. yep. So there's, uh, and you know, that used to be in the purview of the government. Now there are commercial s services being provided there. I didn't know that. So uh, there's a, a couple of groups, I think, that uh, would be worthwhile to, to get involved here. And I hope as part of our workshop at Ascend in October, uh, we'll have some of those there to represent their wares and services to us so that we can better take advantage of them. Very good. Um, it's my understanding that the, the Chinese spy balloon was uh, initially sensed through um, a, a space-based sensing platform after mm -hmm. it was detected on the ground. Um, so very clearly, there's a role to play for these systems and and fixing this domain awareness gap yeah there's uh the, the potential is there for things that aren't moving very quickly like balloons got it if uh you're looking for a uap that's at mock you're probably not going to see it in an exposure taken from space mm -hmm. however there's some new technologies uh actually becoming more familiar with in my lab we're, we're trying to develop a star tracker in our lab to, uh, for CubeSats today, Star Trackers cost about fifty thousand dollars, and so it, it's kind of prohibitive for some satellites. We're looking to bring that down by an order of magnitude and improve the performance by an order of magnitude or so. Mm -hmm. And we've come across something called an event camera, which is all about moving things. If something is static, it doesn't see it, but if it's moving, it picks it up. Mm -hmm. And combining that with artificial intelligence will allow us to reach our end game. Uh, my grad student, Hangre, is working on that, trying to, to bring that to fruition, and he's already seen in the lab some pretty exciting results. Okay. So when we combine the event camera with a neuromorphic chip running some AI solutions, um, that could be the next UAP detector, hmm. Interesting. both you, from orbit and from the ground. What is a neuromorphic trip? chip? neuromorphic chip is something that uh, uses neural networks, mm -hmm. which is basically the architecture that's locked in up here. Uh, a neural network has a node that integrates inputs from, from several areas, like the axons and our neurons. It uh, applies uh, weights to those inputs and sums them up, 
and then creates an output which goes into perhaps many more neurons. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the end, that's neural networks have been trained to uh, now, you know, be in the leading edge of, of uh, social conversations like ChatGPT. Yep, These, this is the, under, fun, the underlying technology in large language models and other type of machine learning, correct? Right, and a professor's nightmare because <laughs> now students can go to ChatGPT and get an answer to just about anything that I might ask them. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's become a challenge on figuring out how, um, you know, is this the next calculator? Or is this really something that we should be wary of for, mm -hmm. for uh, educational purposes? Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think anyone has a good answer to that yet. Well, as you're aware, we're looking at uh, machine learning solutions for some of the data sets that we're exploring at uh, the UAP Integration Committee. Um, we have been engaged with some, uh, some heavy compute providers uh, who will be looking to collaborate with us in order to test our algorithms. Um, but one of the one of the ways that we're considering gathering more data is through um, a, a, a sensor package that could be distributed uh, to academic institutions and even individuals, perhaps. Um, is there anything you could talk about uh, to that end? Yeah, um, AIAA as an organization sponsors several competitions for universities throughout the year: uh, airplane design, spacecraft design, mission design, and we've been talking with the folks who handle those competitions about a, a STEM. Uh, related uh, camera development, uh, where we would provide the template for what a UAP sensing camera might look like. We would uh, uh, allow, of course, innovation and other skills to be brought to play by the university students so that, that we could have a competition. Uh, and then after that, the, the students can uh, put their, their wares together with software, uh, detecting anomalies, and uh, of course, as you know, we're working with some uh, networking providers that could gather all that data in a central place and uh, and hopefully we could create a, a national network of cameras that would collect anomalous data and maybe give us better insight into what's going on over our skies hmm. and of course if, if anyone wants to contribute to that effort uh, we do take donations uh, at AIAA to continue to sponsor this research and, and particularly the, the STEM effort because uh, it, it doesn't get done uh, you know by itself and, and we can use all the help we can get yeah, absolutely so uh, if people are interested uh, in contributing to the efforts at the AIAA UAP Integration Committee, um, we you can set, uh, we do accept uh, donations, tax deductible do no donations uh, through that organization, and you can reach out uh, to myself at ryan.graves at aiaauap.org. Thank you. Uh, outside of resources, uh, what type of personnel skill sets are, are we interested in, in utilizing at our organization? Uh, well, right now we've got a pretty good mix of engineers. Uh, it's probably about time that we start talking about science, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in physics and, and these other areas, so we learn more about the phenomenology and how that relates to the engineering sensor systems we're building. You know, are we looking in the right places, looking for the right signals, uh, the, the amplitude of those signals and frequencies? Um, I think the, the scientists and physicists are uh, probably the next area that I'd like to recruit in mm -hmm. to, to kind of beef up our organization. Five years from now, mm. in the next five years, do we think this is going to be some type of, of is this going to be a new field, either scientific or engineering-wise, that people are going to look into? What? I would think so. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's we have a lot of passionate people in our Integration Outreach Committee that would like us to roll out the answers tomorrow. And I don't think this is a sprint. I think this is a multi-year thing. Um, if there were answers, I suspect we'd know more of it already. Uh, but we don't, and uh, I think it's going to take a while. We're going to have to develop some new engineering, some new science, new physics along the way, perhaps, to understand it. And, of course, that creates a lot of opportunities in academia, industry, and government uh, for that kind of growth. Mm -hmm. I almost see, in my mind, I almost see, you know, a small industry forming here with our ability to integrate this into our defense and strategic capabilities, our ability to improve our sensors, to be specific for this, to integrate this into our, our policy and our legislative frameworks, our aviation safety frameworks. And there's a lot of work to be done, frankly. Yes. Um, and so, you know, that's that's what we've been engaged with. I appreciate your help making that happen mm -hmm. at, the, at the AIAA. I truly could not do it without you, so thank you for <laughs> well, your help. It's been an honor working with you. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure. We have a lot more work to do. Um, we need a lot of help uh, of all types, so I encourage you, if you do have a technical background and would like to contribute uh, on the technical solutions related to this, that you do reach out to us. Uh, there is, you can go to our website at aiaauap.org. 
Uh, and from there, you can reach out, see what we're doing, uh, and join the team. Um, but again, thank you, Mike, for yep. being here. It's a pleasure and it's an honor to have you working with me. Thanks, thank Ryan. You. It's been a real honor working with you as well.